best land is used for agriculture and the best land is what is really required for forest because that's a biodiversity issue that is reserved for forest and only other land can be used for industry or housing for other purposes how do you do that yeah. nationally well when i joined the chipko movement the demand was very simple these forests of the himalaya are not sources of timber they are sources of water and forests they are in forest and forests in the catchment need to be saved for supply of water fortunately in 1981 we got a ban on logging and today the uttarakhand forests are managed for water and soil stabilization that is the kind of policy we need at the national level we need to take it's not a very tough task we need to map the country's vital vulnerable catchments and put that hands off for any kind of development whether it be mining or it be logging and we have to say this is for our water security the second level we have to say this is for forests and having worked in the forest protection movement for so long i know how vital forests are for agriculture we do need one third of our land under forests and i am among those who feels that the tribal rights recognition law should recognize the rights of tribal to live in the forests as forest communities not to live in the forests as urbanites and that's why we do need utilization requirements in terms of tied with those forests like traditional forest dwellers do not want to destroy the forest it's the encroachers the mafias who want to take over the land who would want to destroy the forest in terms of agricultural land itself i think we need it's high time we treated our soil as the most important heritage and defined zoning laws to protect the most fertile lands my heart weeps when i go home to dehradun and see the entire fertile belt between the ganga and yamuna which should never have come under concrete being drowned under this cancer of urbanization now i don't call this housing luxury apartments for the rich golf courses swimming pools supermarkets is not housing for the masses yes. yeah i understand but you know just tell me first of course i fully appreciate that soil security is as important as water security and food security so if you don't talk about soil security which we don't do talk in country yeah. just land has no meaning unless the soil which yeah. is actually Absolutely. the result of millions of years of natural activity but you know talking about now for example take our population 1.1 billion would be 1.6 to 1.8 billion by 2050 even if those houses are not reserved for the rich which of course is a choice that we have but even a, anybody who like to have housing so if we have the population which is going to be 50 percent more at least by another 50 years time how can we survive well, the point is the poor housing is being broken down whether it be for highways or the ceiling operations in the city i don't think it's the housing of the poor that's being considered but as far as the issue of buildings are concerned as far as the issue of homes are concerned you know mumbai such controversies are taking place over the mill lands right now over the redevelopment of slums new va- vocabulary keeps coming up i think the most important issue is land is too precious to be left to a global financial market to decide allocation that's what's happening right now scz's are one way but underhand as the subprime crisis had made mortgages worthless in the united states all that hedge funds and investment money is coming to india to grab the land i think we need a regulation of this we need the government to wake up to put a stop to this both because it's destroying fertile soils and fertile land we need for food but it is taking land beyond the reach of an honest hard working middle class person or honest hard working farmer you can't turn land into a commodity it is time we turned land back into our old slogan that the bhudan movement started sabhi bhumi ko pal ki yeah but you know that is correct you know the one is the class conflict between the rich and the poor as you said but also as you said earlier when we talk about punjab issue that underlying crisis for the real and ecological one so if you look at this again as an ecological issue in which can land sustain 1.6 or 1.8 billion population don't you need a population control major of a very serious nature well you know i've done a lot of work on this suraj and my last book called earth democracy which is a translation of our old concept of vasudev kutumbakam has a whole chapter on this if you look at our own country india where did the population get regulated in kerala where land rights of the poorest person were recognized the hut on which the poor woman in trivandrum lived that land was her sovereign land 
That is what created population control. If you look at the global picture, the explosion of population took place in England when the enclosures of the commons took place, when land was taken away from people. In the case of India, till the British took over, there was stable population. Population explosion started when the British introduced their own zamedari, revenue accumulation and all that. The point is, if you make a living on land, that has already built into it a contraceptive pill. Because you know there's this much of my family I can manage. When you are uprooted and you're on the streets and you're in the slums and you don't know how many days you'll get to work, you don't know how many children will survive till old age, your children become your capital. And in fact, by uprooting people from the land, we are in creating a larger and larger propensity for people to have security in working hands in an unstable marketplace. But the land question in India, I think it's the heart of the political issue right now. And this morning at our conference on Gandhi, globalization and climate change, a very interesting figure was given by a former planning commission member and secretary of government of India, S.P. Shukla. He worked out that the current debate is assuming that because agriculture is contributing 18% of GDP, let 18% of the population be reduced. In, in, uh, let the population in agriculture be reduced to 18%, which in his calculation works out to 380 million working people being thrown out of the rural sector to be absorbed somewhere. On the basis of how they have got absorbed in industry in the last two or three decades, about two lakhs a year, he has worked out that it would take 385 years for the uprooted rural population to be absorbed in urban industrial employment. So what's the solution? The solution is improving the livelihoods of our farmers by stopping this economy of theft. I have written a book called Stolen Harvest. Now all the hard work of the farmer is leaving them victims of suicide because the prices of what they were producing is falling, the cost of what they produce is increasing. The second thing we definitely need to do, and that's where Gandhi really comes back, Gandhi had this dream of village economies, village industrialization, chairs like this made at the village level, paper, handmade paper made at the village level. The, what is it that we cannot make at the village level? After all, everything, all natural resources come from the countryside. And we now live under the illusion that wealth is created in the stock market? Yeah, but you, you think that maybe the, the linking the people's right to land will bring down the population. But still, we need to definitely stabilize the population at a level which will not be very high from what it is today. You know, I really see the absolutely unprecedented increase in population as a symptom of an ecological and social instability. Just as in the rich countries, people have become too rich to have children and they're having zero population growth and negative population growth. They cannot even reproduce their own societies. Because of our conditions of poverty of the people, the opposite is happening. It's part of an imbalance. We have to remove that imbalance. And the first thing we have to remove in that imbalance is the imbalance of natural resource control. If land is concentrated in the hands of the few, we are going to get not just more and more unstable population scenarios, we're going to go get more and more unstable political scenarios. Look at what's happening in Maharashtra right now. We will get more of the Gujar riots. We will get all of this kind of political social instability. So the second thing we have to do is focus an economy in the, on the future. An economy focused on the future thinks of children. When we think of children, we ensure that we create an economy that meets the needs of our children, not the needs, not the greed of a handful of people today. The discounting of the future is what is part of population instability. I know, but at the same time, we have to still agree on a figure which is sustainable for this, because ultimately, you know, we maybe the, you can't leave it to the market forces yes. that they will stabilize the population, because this theory would actually conclude that finally we'll have to, market forces yeah. will really decide. No, but market forces can't decide, they should not be allowed to decide, but I don't think arithmetic can decide either. And arithmetic can't decide for this simple reason, and you know the figures much better than me. If a tiny handful of Americans can use 45% of the world's resources, and if a non-sustainable lifestyle requires five planets, then it's not just an issue of numbers, it's an issue of how we live. Now, India has had a billion people. 
we didn't make a mess of ourselves, but in this last decade, we've ruined every river. We have cut every tree. My heart breaks each time I travel from here to the airport in Dehradun. No matter where you go, every tree is being cut. My soul to Bombay, ancient growth. You know, we used to plant trees along the highway to give shelter to the passerby. Today, we cut the trees so that we can drive a little faster. Now, that basically means there's no fixed arithmetic on numbers, but there's an ethics of how we live on this planet. And we have to reduce our footprint, both by stabilizing our numbers and definitely shrinking our resource per consumption and reducing our energy demands. Yes. I, find it, I find it a shame that in 2007, 2008, when India should be showing the way to the world for a prudent living that is more enriching, yes. we are aping the worst of China, the worst of America, and saying, now we are growing. Well, you, another very passionately you always fight is globalization. I have always seen your like, mm, writings, your, uh, profes your what you profess, you always speak against globalization. Tell me something, Why? how do you think in this modern times, is it really possible for a country, any country, to be totally isolated, to live on their own without any regard to outside organization, is it really possible? The issue of globalization is not an issue of being linked to other countries. After all, we exported spices to the West long before the West could come and conquer us for our spices and our cotton and because our East textile. India Company essentially exactly. came for spices. They came for spices. Now, East India Company was a very different form of trade than yeah. what we traded before they came to That's us. Right. We exported textiles before the East India Company. Yeah. We exported spices before the East India Company. So, international trade is not new to India and India could never be insular no, be, because we have so much to give to the world. Yeah. We have very little to receive. We have a lot to give. The point about the current economic globalization is it is dishonest. The reason I fight so passionately against the rules of WTO is every rule is a dishonest rule. It's dishonest for a Monsanto to say they created a seed when all they did was steal our wheat. It is dishonest for Cargill to say they're being competitive when they're harvesting all the subsidies of the world to then play the market according to what is convenient to them. It is dishonest for the United States to ask us to open up our borders while keep, they keep their borders closed. That's why I say let's have genuine mutual interdependence. Let's create the rules of that. WTO doesn't embody them. So you are actually talking about only the way the globalization is working. You're not against the concept of globalization per se. What you're saying is the way it operates, that is something which needs modification, it needs changes. I'm a global citizen yeah. and I'm a member of the World Future Council, which we have just launched in India. I have been part of the International Forum on Globalization, a coalition of citizens to yeah. watch WTO. I believe in universalism. Yeah. I believe in internationalism and I believe in a fair, ethical, humane, ecologically sustainable globalization. So we need sort of a changing the rules of the way globalization operates, but we not against the, the globalization. Rules. Absolutely. You know, you organize a very interesting program. I was quite impressed uh, looking at the theme in which you'll try to link Gandhi, globalization and climate change. How did you uh, try to link the three? What is the relevance actually? Well, actually, the three have been sitting in separate boxes. So the climate change community goes to Bali, IPCC gets a Nobel Prize, but they keep talking about the carbon in the atmosphere without looking at where did the carbon start. Globalization is the biggest reason for driving up the use of fossil fuel. If every chapati we eat every day has to be shipped from Argentina to us, if every clothing we wear is not from our weavers but is from a factory exploiting its labor in China, that is pushing up the carbon dioxide emissions. That's why globalization is linked to climate change. And Gandhi is linked as a solution because Gandhi gave us the antidote. He taught us how to generate wealth at the last level by generating higher levels of productivity and employment through Swadeshi. He also gave us the political tool to think of different rules, not the rules of WTO imposed on us on behalf of giant corporations who are accountable and you know, totally democratically unaccountable anywhere, he gave us Swaraj as a path of genuine democracy. But to me, the most important part of what he gave us was allowing our conscience 
to wake us up when we know injustice is taking place. And today the time has come where every citizen of India needs to act as a satyagrahi in Gandhi spirit towards non-violence because if we don't sharpen these instruments that we have inherited of celebrating simplicity, not feeling so inferior that we must run to the shopping mall every day, our children are being made to feel inferior if they are not wearing brand names. Yeah. So Gandhiji said that how can one sleep peacefully when he knows that his neighbor is going hungry Absolutely. and that's what we really need to think about. Tell me just lastly because we could like to go on and on talking to you, such an interesting conversation. Tell me, how do you foresee this type of a movement that you are spearheading, many other civil society organizations working? Do you think, how, how what is the future for this organization? Do you think you will keep fighting all your life and hoping that someday the government will wake up? Or you think you should take over the government, change the way government thinks? What What is the future for the civil society movement? Well... As far as I'm personally concerned, some governments are changing. Uttaranchal government has declared an organic policy. I am very closely working with the government of Kerala, where a new ag organic agriculture policy is being worked on. But I'm also an international chair of an uh, international commission on the future of food. And internationally, governments are changing. 43 governments in Europe have signed an agreement with us on GMO-free zones, that they will not accept GMO um, uh, seeds and GMO products. So governments are changing. The problem is centralized governments are more influenced by greed. And what we need is a shift from an economics of greed to an economics of sharing, an economics of short term to an ex economics of permanence. On that, I feel if the world does not make that change, it's going to go up in flames either because of climate change and global warming or go up in flames because of conflict. So there's only one way if we have to live into the future as a species, as society, and that is sustainably, using resources prudently, sharing them more equitably, and celebrating life in our simplicity. In fact, one you, all religions agree on one thing, that ultimately the whole mankind is going to just get wiped out. So probably what you said, it's only a choice whether climate change should wipe it out or our own action should wipe it out or something else should wipe no, it out. No, there is a third choice <laughs> that we do our bit to continue to hold the precious life we have inherited and, and hold the, it for the that's future. That's for the Gandhian way. I hope you succeed in your mission in changing the mindset of the people so that they pursue a different path that you talked about. I've, I'm thankful to you for talking to me and also my other viewers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Suresh. This was Dr. Vandana Shiva talking to us in top shot on how we should try to change our thinking to make a living a better, better way of life than what we are doing today. Next week, we'll be joined by another distinguished personality like Dr. Shiva, who will be talking to us about some other issue. Come back next week. This is Suresh Prabhu bidding you goodbye in Top Shot. Bye-bye. Good night. Welcome to another edition of Top Shot in which we interview the top personality who talks to us about various issues concerning you and me. Today we are very fortunate to have someone like Dr. Mandana Shiva and we are meeting in her office, the Navadnath office, talking to, going to talk to her about various issues related to you and my concerns. So Mandana Ji, thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this program and very nice to see your office here wherein uh, I can see variety of different type of food. I hope it's all organic. We and only d deal with organic Sureshji. <laughs> and I wish I could uh, always eat such organic food. That's the okay. desire of I'm sure many of us. 
I wish all of India was served organic food because it's the only way to feed India. But tell me, suppose if all of us were to eat this organic food, 1.1 billion people, do you think uh, we have enough land and enough uh, productivity to feed people with the organic food, sands, fertilizers, pesticides and all? There's a big myth that has been put out since the days of the Green Revolution, that the Green Revolution intensified agriculture. And then the assumption is the more, the in more intensive agriculture is, the more it will produce. But all that the Green Revolution did was intensify chemicals in agriculture. Biological productivity actually went down. Unit acre of land produced less biomass and less nutrition. In fact, organic farming is the biologically intensive form of farming. Chemical farming is the chemical intensive form of farming. Now, when you use more chemicals, you have to borrow, farmers get into debt, your water gets polluted.